Thank you for joining us for this week's weekly webinar series. My name is Molly Keck, and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And we are going to be discovering and learning about the other beneficial insects that you may not realize are out there in numerous numbers in your landscape. Those are the parasitoids and the decomposers. A parasitoid is an organism that attaches to or it lives within a host and only one single host within that parasitoid's life cycle. It is generally smaller than the host um, as it's developing, and it's, it's most of the time it's internal, developing on the inside, but there are some situations where they might be external, developing on the outside of the host's body. Very, very sci-fi kind of a um, situation. So uh, there are different species of parasitoids. We're going to cover a handful of those. Uh, most of the time, these parasitoids are pretty host-specific to at least the type of insect that they will infest. So in other words, um, some parasitoids will only infest, lay their eggs in caterpillars, but they don't really care what species of caterpillar. Or they'll choose eggs of a, of a caterpillar. Or they will go after small insects like aphids. Here are some pictures of the outcome of a parasitoid. So the as they're emerging or what you see happening to the insect that they're parasitizing. On the left-hand side is a caterpillar, and these are actually pupa that have busted through the body of that caterpillar, and they're ready to emerge as an adult. And you can see they're just barely that little teeny tiny adult um, that is trying to emerge out of that out of that pupa case. Sometimes, like in the case of forward flies, they might parasitize the head capsule and pop the head off and then emerge from the head. On the right-hand side, those are mummified aphids. Aphids... Um, are of course little tiny sap sucking insects and there are little tiny wasps that will lay their eggs in an aphid and make them be mummified or fattened and bigger and so of course they're not doing any feeding while they're doing that. Braconidae or braconid wasps are one species of parasitic wasp and these guys generally attack larval stages of um, in this case you see aphids but they'll also attack larval stages of other insects. They're internal, but sometimes they might pop out and pupate outside of the host. So that picture that you saw in the previous slide is an example of a braconid wasp. These guys really like the larvae of beetles, caterpillars, flies, and sawflies. But as you can see in that picture on the left-hand side, they're also attacking aphids. Chalicid wasps are kind of interesting. They have funny little hind legs that have like big it's like if you had gigantic calves, I guess, is what a chalicid wasp would look like. These guys also attack larval stages, mainly of flies and butterflies and moths, and they will um, be on the inside of the host, and they're very small. Usually the ones that you see are yellow and black, even though nearly all black ones have some yellow coloring on them, but you know it's a chalicid wasp because they have those really weird hind legs that almost look like backwards... Um, uh, crab claws or something like that. Evaneid wasps or ensign wasps are very interesting wasps. They lay their eggs in the egg cases of American cockroaches mainly. They might also do it for smoky brown cockroaches, but mainly it's American cockroaches. And um, if you find these in a building, it indicates that you have American cockroaches around because that's their host. They look like a mix between a cricket and a wasp, kind of. They, they're very funny shaped. They usually land on walls about eye length um, or eye level. So you might see these in, in, usually you find them in abandoned homes or homes that have severe American cockroach infestations, but also a lot of times in buildings. And that's because everyone goes away at night, the cockroaches come out and they start to feed and these wasps get prevalent so that they can help control those cockroach populations. Ichneumon wasps are kind of a cool wasp that you might see if, especially if you live somewhere close to um, a water source, like maybe you live on a lake or something like that. You leave your lights on at night and you'll find these guys. Their preferred hosts are beetles and caterpillars and even other wasps, and they'll attack both the larvae and the pupa stage of these guys. And, and there are a lot of different species of this Ichneumon wasp. Ichneumonidae is the family. So they might use the, the host and, and, and develop inside or even outside. And they can be huge inside. They're very, very long. And then the ovipositor of females is really kind of wimpy. Um, 
very uh, uh, flexible kind of a material. And that's usually how you see them. You're wondering what on earth these guys are. So they have a very unique elongated abdomen. And then the females have those really long ovipositors. That's how I can always identify them. You've probably also heard of tricker gamma wasps. These guys um, had back in the had their heyday back in the day, where people loved to purchase them and release them to help control caterpillars up in their trees. And so um, they are native and they're already out there. You can collect them if you really know where to go looking for them. But they will lay their eggs in the egg stages of moths and sawflies and other insects. So they don't just specifically go after one species of caterpillar. What we do know about these guys is that if you do releases of them, you have to do gigantic, massive releases to see any results. Because basically, if trigger gamma wasps are doing their job, they're already prevalent. And whatever you release, it's not going to probably do very much good. They work when you have more closed systems um, and you do huge augmentations, which is not what most of us do as homeowners. So. Um, I always tell people if you want to use trichogamma wasps to try to control things, try it. It might be kind of fun. If it works for you, I don't argue with success, but there are always better alternatives to actually get um, good control of, of whatever it is, the caterpillar it is that you're trying to manage. Velvet ants, or also called cow killers, um, called this because their sting is so painful that it's known to, it could potentially kill a cow, or it hurts so bad it feels like it could kill a cow. These are actually wasps. They're not, we, they're not ants. And the females have no wings. The males are winged. And they will attack and parasitize the larvae of ground bees and beetles and flies, and mainly things that are rusting and on the ground. And the reason... Um, and you find them on the ground. So that's you, that's why they're going after prey that's in those areas. So the female will lay her eggs on the host and the larvae develops inside and pupates inside the host. If you, you never want to pick one of these up because the painful, the sting is extremely painful. The females do sting, the males do not. They don't always come in that, that red velvet color, but they do always look very, very hairy. So they're very fuzzy, velvety looking um, ant-like insects. But I've seen them totally black, um, all black with just a stripe of red. I mean, multiple different colors based on what species you've got. Forehead flies are um, something that you may have heard of back just probably 10, 15 years ago. They really had a lot of attention because they were thought to be our new thing to try to control fire ants. And when we did initial releases of forehead flies, we knew that this parasitoid would not control fire ants, but what it might do is stress them out, um, make them go away during the daytime so when you're outside they're not stinging you. So we we had some um, some hope that they would help other means of management work a little bit better. It was just one more piece of arsenal in, in the battle that we had against red imported fire ants. So this is a, a fly that is very specific to red imported fire ants because the shape of the ovipositor where it lays its eggs only fits into the neck of the fire ant. And they actually go after different species, go after different sized fire ants too, based on knowing how they can put that ovipositor into the, into the head of the, the fire ant. And so basically they will dive bomb them, the egg will um, uh, hatch, it will migrate up to the head, they, the larva will feed on the muscles that attach the head to the body. It actually zombatizes or turns a zombie into the ant and will make the ant leave and go away from the rest of the colony. And then the head falls off. And, and one of the reasons we think that they, they make them do that is because fire ants often clean the dead and the trash out of their hive. And so that way it leaves the forward flies close enough, but not to where the, the um, fire ants will remove it completely and get it out of there. And then emerges out as another adult to do the whole thing all over again. And I have some cool videos that take some time that will show you. This is slow motion, and this is an ant that has been um, irritated by this forehead fly. <clears throat> the, if you were to mess with ants, they detect the ants because they um, smell the pheromones that they're releasing. And so she's coming, and she curves her butt, even as this is so incredibly slow motioned. You still can barely see what's going on because they're so quick and they're so zippy. 
and they, they'll stun the ant after they lay their egg in there. They have no idea what happened. They're stunned for a period of time, and then they keep going about their business. And here is an ant that is going to emerge. This is this is the graveyard of all of the heads. And these are um, flies that are going to emerge from the head. So they actually come kind of out of the mouth. All those heads and that little bitty teeny tiny fly that will come out of it. I mean, it's very amazing. These are these are native to the areas where fire ants are native, which is Brazil. South America, Paraguay. Um, and so we just did, we've done releases of these guys to help control, to get colonies established to help manage fire ants. But after extensive research has been done to ensure that they only attack fire ants and not our native ants, and that um, they they won't, you know, cause undue harm. So there was a lot of, there always is a lot of research that has to go into this. Okay, so that's our, our parasitoids, just a handful of those parasitoids, really cool and really interesting. And then our other beneficial insects are our decomposers. And these guys will break down dead or decaying organisms, living organisms. So they break down dead or decaying plant material or living thing. And they'll use that non-living organic compounds as food. And so it helps um, break down trash and turn it into treasure. They gain energy um, carbon, nutrients for growth, and it allows them to develop. And for the most part, we think of them as the gross bugs that are out there, maggots and cockroaches. But in reality, they're extremely important. And if we didn't have them, we'd have a lot of trash, we'd have a lot of dog poop. We'd have a lot of things around this world that we wouldn't necessarily want to have piled up. One of those things that is a good, great decomposer are grubs. Grubs is just a general term for any beetle larva. So we hear the term grubs and automatically assume it's the things that will ruin our grass. And that is not necessarily the case. If you are digging around and you find grubs that are greater than half an inch, these of course are much larger than half an inch. They're huge grubs. They are considered beneficial. They're either predatory or if they're real gigantic, they're usually composters, breaking down um, trash, decomposing that stuff. If they're not in the turf and they're still greater than it, if they're not in the turf, why do we even care about it, right? If they're not in the turf and they're greater than half an inch, for sure they're good. Um, if they're not in the turf and they're small, who cares? They're not prob they're not hurting your grass because that's not where your turf is. If they're in the turf and they're half an inch or smaller, then you might consider that they're white grubs that could potentially be feeding on your grass. But there are lots and lots of species of grubs. So not every grub is necessarily one of our grass feeding grubs. Usually the big ones are those ones at the top that will turn into a rhino beetle or an ox beetle or a Hercules beetle. Um, they're, they're in the family Dynicity. The very, very, very small ones, you can see in that bottom picture, those hands and that pin, how teeny tiny those grubs are. Those will turn into May beetles or June beetles. Now we have lots of species of May beetles and June beetles. You probably left your porch lights on at, at night and found multiple different sizes and looks to these things. Not every single one that you find at your porch lights is gonna lay the eggs that will feed on the turf. There are only a handful of species that do that. I think in Texas, it's only about three. So just because you find May beetles doesn't mean that they're gonna hurt your grass. And if you find big fat grubs, consider them to be a cool thing to have indication you have good, great organic matter in your soil. Dung beetles are another cool decomposer. These guys will roll dung into a perfect near sphere of a ball and they will do it upside down. And they, the males and females, they all kind of do it together, helping each other. But as soon as they smell fresh dung, they'll come zooming in, flying down and start to um, roll that dung into a ball. She lays her eggs in the middle of that ball or lays her eggs and then rolls the dung around it. And then she'll dig a hole and she'll dump it into um, the ground. And um, that provisions the nest for her babies. Once they hatch out, they'll feed on the dung. Um, dung beetles are so interesting. They were worshipped by the Egyptians, right? Because it's a sign of rebirth, a sign of something, out of something gross comes something amazing, you know, 
Um, it's a it's a, a a very interesting way to develop, and Mother Nature makes some very interesting things out of these insects. If we didn't have dung beetles, we would have quite a few cow patties in pastures. I mean, they they are considered to be very beneficial. Nobody really likes cockroaches, but cockroaches are very beneficial. And this is a picture of two types of cock or one type of cockroach that you have most likely seen outside when you've been digging around. And you may have found them inside of your house. Um, sometimes they will make their way indoors, especially when it gets extremely dry or extremely cold. This is called a Suriname cockroach, and it's just kind of a, another name people like to call them are wood roaches. They're found outdoors under debris. They might be found in your compost. The right-hand side is the immature or the nymph before it develops the wings. They are completely harmless. They're non-structurally infesting in Texas. Um, they, if you find them in your, in your um, garden, there's nothing to be concerned about them for because they are just breaking down decaying organic matter. They're not hurting anything, and they're probably not going to make their way at all into your home. Worrying about this kind of a cockroach outdoors is the same as trying to control the um, birds in the sky. It just isn't possible or feasible, um, and there's just no reason to be overly concerned about them. But many cockroaches are very important, especially in rainforests where they're breaking down rotting fruit and other kinds of material that might be falling to the rainforest floor. So cockroaches, while we don't like them in our homes, have a very significant role in the ecosystem. So do flies, even though flies are gross. Usually there's um, the type of fly that we hate to think about are blowflies, which is that guy on the, in the picture, very shiny. And then the, um, the larvae we call maggots, and they will eat decaying organic matter, carrion, um, anything that's rotting. It, it can be rotten chicken outside. It can be dirty trash can where things are getting really gross. Um, they lay their eggs in anything that's nasty. Dog food, cat food that got wet and sat outside too long, they lay their eggs in that as well. So will fruit flies, filth flies, and house flies. So, but they're very important in the ecosystem. And if you don't like having them around, figure out what's rotting and get rid of it if you can, because um, that's why they're there. They're only there if there's a place to lay their eggs and something to feed on. So get rid of that junk, that dying, decaying organic matter. Clean out your trash cans. Make sure you don't have anything rotting outside, and that will help control your flies. There is a species of fly called a soldier fly that is that you may or may not have seen, um, if you, especially if you have compost. This is a, a decomposing type of a fly. They do not indicate that you have anything necessarily rotting. They just like things that are high in organic matter that are very wet and decomposing. So if your compost bin got very wet um, or you like having it nice and moist, then you probably have soldier flies in there. Um, the, the adults are kind of a metallic blue color and they're very loud when they fly, but they are pretty cryptic. They don't necessarily like to be around people. The the fly larvae are um, very unique and very uh, flattened and much larger and not as gooey looking as the blowfly and filth fly larvae. Um, <clears throat> but they, if you have them in your compost, it's actually a wonderful thing to have. They're helping break that down a little bit quicker. Pill bugs or isopods, roly poly sow bugs are also decomposers, only feeding on decaying organic matter. So again, if they're if they're hurting your plants or you, you think that they're feeding on your plants, let's figure out why those plants are decaying. Are they young, young transplants that need a little bit more attention and a little bit more protection? Or do you have a plant that's just not doing very well and they've come in to take care of a good situation? By and large, though, they're feeding and breaking down that mulch. You see them under rocks. They're helping to break down and decay and uh, uh, decay that organic matter. Millipedes do the exact same thing. Completely harmless most of the time to your plants. In very rare occasions do they cause major issues, but it's usually when you're dealing with very, very young transplants, established plants, figure out why it's decaying. Let's, let's control that, and then the millipedes will take care of themselves. Totally fine to see these inside of your house, crawling up the side of your house or anywhere else. They're not harmful to you. Um, they're just out there. They're, you know, these are things that are just naturally a part of nature and we can't control everything and there's no reason that we should try to. And then even things that we hate so much because they cause so much damage um, to our structures can be considered beneficial. Boring beetles and termites, while we don't want them associated with our homes or things inside of our home, 
We do want them out there in nature because they help break down dying trees, dead roots, things that we don't want out in the ground so we can make more room for new trees and new plants. Termites are considered um, very beneficial in that way because they're under the ground doing an amazing job without us ever realizing that we're stepping over all the work that they're doing. You should also know that termites are found in everybody's yard. If you were to dig or monitor for them, you would come up with termite colonies. What you don't want to do is allow for conducive conditions, exposed wood, very moist wood, reasons for them to come into the house and start feeding on our good wood. We want to keep them out there in the yard, and it's okay if you get digging or you leave some wood outside piled up and you find termites there. As long as it's not touching your house, that's normal. You're always going to find termites out in your yard. They are. There are probably more colonies of termites than maybe even um, homes in your neighborhood oftentimes. So let's say that you want to practice some biological control. Well, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. One is augmentation. That's where you purchase and you release them. Um, and that's usually for profit. Uh, somebody, somebody is selling them to you, right? Conservation would be just recognizing who these good guys are and conserving them, reducing pesticide use. That is probably the most feasible way that we as homeowners can increase and practice biological control. And then there's importation. That's nonprofit type things. Usually the USDA is involved with that. Um, forward flies, when we did the releases of that, they were not for sale and still are not for sale. This was a government um, funded or government, maybe not government funded, but a government um, uh, recognized and encouraged practice. And then salt cedar beetle was the other is the other um, uh, is another really great example of where we have been able to use insects to help control an invasive species like the salt cedar uh, tree. But these were nonprofit things that that you had to have special permission. The USDA had to approve that you were allowed to do it. And usually it was only universities that did releases of these. So I'm going to leave this one up here for a little bit for you. If you want to purchase some of your good bugs, whether these are parasitoids or uh, predators, there are a couple of places that you can look. There's a, a suppliers of beneficial organisms in North America. You can go to their website right there, and they have a huge list of places where you can purchase. You can also just contact the Association of Natural Biocontrol Producers and see if they have any suggestions. And then in Texas, there's two companies that I'm aware of that I think are still active and selling different um, parasitoids and predators, Biomanaged Services and Cunifin, um, the insectary are two options for you if you want to reach out to them and see if they have things. And that concludes this week's weekly webinar series. This was a short one, just really covering the second half of who are the other good guys that are out there. My name is Molly Keck, and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County, and thanks for joining us.